Okay, uh, we're going to get started this evening. If I could have your attention. Thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to the 2013 Wright Brothers Lectureship in Aeronautics. Uh, my name is Kevin Boca, and it was my pleasure to nominate today's lecture. This lecture commemorates the first powered flights made by Orville and Wilbur Wright at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903. It is one of the most prestigious awards given by the Institute and emphasizes significant advances in aeronautics by recognizing major leaders and their contributions. Today's lecture is Thomas Kogan, who served as the Director of Airplane Product Development for Boeing Commercial Airplanes. In this role, he was responsible for the development of all new and derivative airplanes. And I want to mention to you, I'm a Boeing employee myself, and, and uh, it was important to Tom, he wanted me to note that he is uh, accepting this award for the 787 team. It was obviously a very large team, and together that team achieved this great accomplishment. Named to the, his, the position he held uh, in July 2008, Mr. Kogan was also responsible for advanced concepts and the analysis of competitor airplanes. Prior to this assignment, Mr. Kogan was the chief project engineer for the 787 Dreamliner during the initial development phase. In this role, he was responsible for the definition of product integrity of the airplane, leading the cross-functional team responsible for integrating the airplane and achieving the technical and business targets for the program. He was named to this position in March 2003. Previously, Mr. Kogan served as the chief project engineer for the Sonic Cruiser, 747X and 757 programs. He has also held positions as the Manufacturing Business Unit Leader for Developmental Manufacturing, Integrated Product Team Leader for the 757-300 program, and 737-600-700 and 800 program, and Senior Manager in Payloads for Airplane Configuration Definition and Interior Certification. Mr. Kogan was promoted into management in April 1989 when he served as a Marketing Manager for the 787 and 737 programs. During his first 12 years at Boeing, he worked in the aerodynamic staff on the 737, 757, and 7J7 programs. A graduate of Texas A&M University nearby, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering, Mr. Kogan joined Boeing in 1977. He now serves on the Engineering Advisory Council for the Dwight Look College of Engineering at Texas A&M University. We are pleased to have Mr. Kogan with us this evening to speak on Creating the Dream, Development of the 787 Dreamliner. I now invite Tom to uh, join me on the podium. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, especially for your attendance. You never know when you do a presentation like this and you have a big room if you're going to have a handful of people in the front or a larger audience. So I appreciate your interest in the 787 and uh, for being here. Now, the, the challenge I had with putting together this presentation is how do you condense uh, a decade of work into 45 minutes? And for those of you who are not familiar with commercial airplane development, uh, that's what it takes now to, to do a new airplane. I wanted to have a theme for the, uh, the presentation, and I didn't have to look any further than the title of this lecture, The Wright Brothers uh, Lecture in Aeronautics. You see, it wasn't Wilbur Wright, and it wasn't Orville Wright, but the Wright Brothers that achieved powered flight. It was a team of individuals. And that's the way it is in our industry. For any major accomplishment like this, it's a team of people. Whether you're talking about the first commercial airplane, the, uh, the first jet-powered aircraft, our U.S. space program, the 787, it's a team which makes a project like this happen. And so, uh, so that's going to be my theme throughout this thing, is, is the team and the achievement of the team. Uh, in that vein, as an example, I was only one of three chief project engineers on the program. So as Kevin said, I had the initial phase of the program, the concept development phase of the program, 
And following me was Mike Delaney, who is now the Vice President of Engineering for Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And so Mike had the detailed design phase of the program and the start of the manufacturing as we stood up the production system. You know how they say the devil is in the details? Well, Mike and the team got to meet the devil. And, uh, and they survived. In fact, they did great. They uh, designed an airplane that uh, I think is a real game changer. And following Mike Delaney, the current vice president and chief project engineer for the program, Mike Sennett, took over. And he took the airplane through the test program and entry into service and uh, continues to serve in that role. So that's three of thousands of engineers that worked on this program. Engineers not only in Puget Sound, where the 787 is built, but engineers across the country and around the world. Boeing engineers and engineers at our partners. So thousands of engineers have had some part in this program. But it's not just engineers. It takes a whole team to make an airplane like this happen. So manufacturing and operations have to build the airplane. Sales and marketing have to sell it. Finance has to make sure we keep our budgets in order. We have an administrative staff that provides the daily support to make the program work. Business operations, the people who manage the supply chain, and our partners. So it's a huge team thousands and thousands of people that make an airplane like this happen. And so it's not any one individual, and we give out awards to individuals, but the awards really go to the team because they're the ones that make it happen. For those of you who are not familiar with the 787, there's two models, the 787-8, which is a smaller variant, and the 787-9. The 787-8 is about 200 to 250 passengers in a tri-class interior, international type of operation and the Dash 9 is 250 to about 300 passengers. Now there's two attributes to the 787 that really uh, got the airline's attention when we started working on it. One was the fuel efficiency. So an airplane that was 20% more fuel efficient than the airplanes it was replacing. And the other one is what's shown on this chart, the range of the airplane. So never before in the history of commercial aviation did we have an airplane of this size that could fly 7,600 to 8,500 nautical miles? And the importance of that for the airlines was the ability to open new markets and fly point to point with this small airplane. It was a lower risk option in light of the airplanes that customers had to use previously, like bigger airplanes, 777s and 747s. So they could open these new markets. We estimated there was something like 400 to 500 new markets that they could address with this airplane. And that's what uh, one of the things that made it a game changer. There was four key technologies that uh, allow us to do this. Uh, you can see them on the chart here. Uh, in terms of the 20% fuel burn, the composite primary structure contributes about 3 to 4% of that uh, fuel efficiency improvement. The advanced aerodynamics, about 3 to 4 percent. The more advanced uh, systems, more electric systems on the airplane, the architecture, about 3 to 4 percent. And then the propulsion system, uh, something on the order of 8 to 9 percent. So in total, our target was a 20 percent fuel efficiency improvement. The airplane is out flying today in service, and it's doing at least that good. So uh, we were able to hit that target. But it wasn't just fuel efficiency and it wasn't just range. The airline said, we need it to be a profitable airplane and you need to address both cost and revenue, both sides of the ledger. So the lighter weight of the airplane allows us to achieve lower operating fees, navigation fees and landing fees, for example. And the composites and the more advanced its systems allow us to uh, reduce the maintenance costs on the airplane. The synergy, the operational synergy with the 777 and what we did with the flight deck uh, allows us to help the airlines reduce training costs. And when we designed the airplane, we designed in the provisions for all the different options that we uh, uh, carry in the catalog 
And so when an airline buys an airplane, if they decide later to move that within their fleet or even sell it to another airline, the costs of changing the airplane different from what it is today is much lower. And then on the revenue side, the airplane's fast. So it flies as fast as a 777 or a 747. And because of its cross section, it carries LD3 containers. So it has more cargo capability than the airplanes it's replacing. Talked about nonstop routes. We designed it so that it has the flexibility to put in lots of different seating configurations. So the airlines can very quickly reconfigure the airplane to match the market demands uh, at any given time. And last of all, passenger preference. And as people who fly a lot on airplanes, as most of us do, uh, this is where we interface with a machine. And you like to get on an airplane and know that you're going to have the comfortable flight. So we spent a lot of time working on the interior of the airplane. There's two points that can be made with this chart. One of them is the, uh, the interplay of technologies. So one of the great things about having a composite fuselage is you can put larger windows in the airplane and pay a very small weight penalty. And something that we learned early on in the program, the reason people like to fly is because they like to fly. And they like looking out the windows and seeing that they're flying. So with 30% larger windows, the passengers from anywhere in the airplane can look out the windows and see that they're flying. And again, as we designed the interior of the airplane in conjunction with this composite technology, we were able to achieve these bigger windows. The second point I'd like to make is getting back to this concept of team. Think about the team it takes to design uh, just the interior of this airplane, let alone all the other components. Uh, it takes structures engineers and systems engineers and payloads engineers and manufacturing engineers. It takes people from operations so that you can build the interior quickly. It's, uh, it's really a team environment to make something like this happen and to make it look this good. And when you roll that all together, you end up with a product that, uh, that works in the marketplace. And we attribute it to something that Boeing has done very well for a long time, and that is work with and listen to your customers. The customers know what their requirements are. They can help you design the product. And we've followed that mantra for many, many years, and it's led over and over against successful products. And it happened again on the 787. Uh, as an airplane person, I love the picture on the bottom. It looks cool. As a stockholder, I like the numbers on the top. So uh, it's uh, one of the, uh, the programs in the history of the company that sold the most airplanes in the shortest time. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the program. And one of the first questions that's asked is, uh, when did the program start? And I know there's a number of my colleagues out there, and if you asked them, every one of them would probably give you a different answer. Um, I kind of put it in these terms. We started developing the technology that went on the airplane in the late 1990s. And uh, in about the year 2000, one of our engineers came up with a clever concept to make the airplane fly a little bit faster and do it for the same amount of fuel as the airplanes it would be replacing. We call that the Sonic Cruiser. How many of you remember the Sonic Cruiser? How many would have liked us to build the Sonic Cruiser? <laughs> well, we studied the airplane for a couple of years with about 15 customers. And while we were showing the Sonic Cruiser in public, behind the scenes, we were uh, talking with our customers about this airplane and another airplane, which a small team had developed earlier called the reference airplane. And this airplane we called the reference airplane was 20% more fuel efficient. So when our customers asked us, they said, what if you slow down and don't fly near the speed of sound like the Sonic Cruiser, but fly at the same speed as a 777 or a 747? We said, you know, it'd be about 20% more fuel efficient. And they said, we'd like to see that airplane. So we, uh, in the public, we were showing the Sonic Cruiser to the airline customers we were working with. We were showing both airplanes. 
then in November of 2002, we had a meeting in Seattle. We showed them all the data, our customers. Uh, we looked at the data and we said, what do you think? And unanimously, they said, uh, we'd like you to build the reference airplane. They said, we know there's value in speed, but we know for sure what the value is of fuel efficiency. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues, Michael Drake, before the presentation, uh, based on what's happened with fuel prices uh, since that time period, we really made the right decision. So was born the 7E7, so I guess some could say that that's when the program really started uh, in 2002, fall of 2002. So we started working on the configuration. Over the next several years, uh, a lot of important decisions to be made, uh, a lot of layouts of different size wings, different diameter fuselages, all the types of things that go into concept development. Uh, we selected the material systems and we had uh, separate meetings for deciding whether we used composites or aluminum for the wings uh, and the fuselage. And we decided, of course, to have composites for both. So the airplane's about 50% composites. Uh, Rolls-Royce and General Electric provided some engines that uh, looked like they would work well on the airplane and they got selected to per participate on the program. And then we had the naming contest. And I don't know how many of you remember that, but we teamed with America Online, rolled out the image of the airplane, which is the one you see in the top center of the chart. We called it the AOL image. And we gave uh, the, the people that wanted to participate in this uh, an option of three or four different names. And the winner was the Dreamliner. So ultimately became the 787 Dreamliner. But that's how the name uh, came about. And so we worked really hard with uh, some key customers. And finally, in April 2004, Omnipon Airways stepped up and, uh, and launched the program. It takes a very special airline to launch a new airplane program. They've got to be technically capable. Uh, they have to be resilient, emotionally resilient, and patient, and, and very, very, uh, very capable. And I can't think of a better airline to have worked with on the 787 than Alnapon Airways. They're a first-class airline, first-class engineers. And, uh, and they launched the program and uh, were the first to put it into service. In January 2005, we started working on uh, actually building some of these composite barrels that we we're going to need for the fuselage. It's, uh, the, the big secret on composites is this. We knew that composites were uh, a good material to use in building airplanes. The problem was it was very expensive because if you think about hand layup of 100,000 pounds of composite on an airplane like the 787, uh, it would not be cost effective. So coming up with techniques to automate the laydown of the composites where you're doing tens of pounds of composites very quickly uh, as opposed to doing a hand layup is what made it cost effective. And so we started testing the manufacturing techniques. We produced some barrels and said, yeah, that works. And, uh, and that part of the program has really worked well. So in early 2005, as the, uh, the airplane was launched uh, by ANA, uh, it became named the 787, so we give it a letter designation until it's launched, and then we give it a number designation, and 787 followed 777. And we told the uh, aerodynamicists to put down their pencils and stop messing with the external lines of the airplane so we could get on with doing loads and designing uh, the interior parts of the airplane. And so uh, the high-speed line freeze uh, occurred, and we finalized the, the exterior of the airplane. And we've been working for some time on the flight deck. Now, that was a dilemma for us, too, because with the technology available to us, we could do this really cool-looking flight deck that would you know, provide the safety that we need, uh, give the pi pilots the situational awareness uh, that we insist on. Uh, but the airlines came back to us and said, well, be a little bit careful as you design this, because remember, training costs are a big part of our operational costs. 
and we have a lot of pilots that fly 777s that we would like to be able to fly this airplane because you know it's a lot of the same type of routes. So we designed a flight deck that incorporated all that technology, gave the pilots a situational awareness, uh, stayed with our flight deck philosophy, which we had demonstrated over the years, provided good levels of safety, and yet we made it common with the 777 such that we can get a common type certificate. And then there's the program within the program. We had these parts that were being built around the world in Italy, in Japan, in South Carolina. And we had to get them all to Seattle to be able to put the airplane together because that's where final assembly was. So the best way we could think to do that was to build a really big airplane. So we bought some Mu 747s, we cut the tops off of the passenger cabin, uh, did a lot of structural modifications, built a large shell to have a larger cargo volume, and thus was born the Dreamlifter. Isn't it beautiful? I don't know why people always laugh when I say that. I'm not talking about the picture in the upper left before it was painted. I'm talking about the, the painted one. Uh, it's amazing to watch it fly. You think it's going to fall out of the air because it looks like it flies too slow for, uh, for its size. But uh, it's moved a lot of pounds of parts uh, around the world and is working very well for us. In 2006, during the summer, we built a demonstration wing to demonstrate the manufacturing techniques for making a composite wing and tested an outboard section to make sure it had the structural integrity we needed. So that completed. And then the parts started coming. Spring of 2007, uh, all hours of the day and night, we had parts start coming into Seattle so we could start putting the airplane together. And then in uh, that same summer, uh, we started putting those parts together and final assembly. For those of you who build model airplanes like I do, uh, the airplane goes together pretty much the same way. You start putting fuselage pieces together, you put the wings on and you put the empennage on and hang the engines and, and you have an airplane. The problem that we started running into though at this time was um, the systems installation on the airplane and some of the work that was supposed to be going on at our partners was not keeping up with what we needed at this point in the program. So in July, when we rolled the airplane out, even though we had from the outside a complete looking airplane, from the inside we were really still missing a lot of the parts that we needed uh, at that point in the program. And it was at that time, shortly that thereafter, that we made the announcement that we were going to have to slide the program pretty significantly. And I was uh, one of the people that went around to our customers and told them the situation, explained it to them. And fortunately, they saw the value in the airplane, that they stayed with us. Um, they said, uh, we understand. We know that creating an airplane like this, pushing technology is hard. And, and you know, just uh, keep us informed of how it's going. So we re, uh, rescheduled the program and, uh, and moved ahead. Now I showed you earlier uh, how many airplanes with how many customers. Uh, in December 2007, we had already sold 787 of the airplanes. So remember, we, we launched it with A&A &A back in 2004, and we already had 787 orders. So clearly, in working with the airlines, we had created something here of great value to them. And then in the summer of 2008, about a year later than uh, what we had intended originally, uh, we got power on the airplane. I guess that's a little bit like your first child being born. Uh, the airplane comes to life and you can start running systems checks, uh, doing things like gear swings and uh, flight control checks and it starts becoming a real airplane. And then we started preparing it for first flight. The airplane number is uh, ZA-001, that's the first airplane. So the ZA is the designation that was given to the 787 program. We have a different designation in flight tests for our different models. And ZA-001 uh, started doing the engine runs. We did fuel checks to make sure we had the integrity in the fuel tanks and the fuel system. We run something called a gauntlet test where we hook the airplane up to a van that allows us to, for the purposes of the airplane, simulate flight so that we can shut down systems, boot systems, 
do all the things you need to do to make sure the redundancy on the airplane is there and works properly. Very, very intensive testing. And then something really bad happened. Um, we, uh, we had gone to the Paris Air Show and announced that we were ready for first flight. And about a week later, uh, we discovered we had a pretty significant problem. During the static testing of the wing, we found an anomaly in the stringer run out where the wing connects to the side of body. And, uh, and we knew it was a pretty significant problem. And there's times in your career when you're really proud of the company you work for. And that was one of those times that I was very proud of Boeing because despite the embarrassment and the courage it took, we announced we were not going to continue with first flight until we fully understood this problem, designed a fix, tested it, and put it on the airplane because safety is always first. And we weren't going to risk um, you know, the safety of our crews, our flight crew, by flying an airplane where we didn't understand a problem that we had uncovered. So we, uh, we made that announcement and again, tribute to the team. I think we uh, accomplished something that was nearly miraculous. We, uh, we looked at it and thought that the very quickest we could get this done, fix this problem, uh, analyze it, fix it, was like nine to 12 months. So we're gonna have to delay the program uh, there as much as maybe a year because of this problem. But we assembled a cross enterprise team. So not just Boeing commercial airplanes, but from across the Boeing enterprise. We had people from engineering, manufacturing, material science, tooling. We had our partners involved and they set to work. And they worked seven days a week and sometimes around the clock to analyze the problem, figure out what the problem was, figure out a solution, design the solution, build it, put it on the airplane, and test it. And when I say put it on the airplane, we put it on the static uh, article and then started incorporating uh, that work into the airplanes that were sitting out on the flight line. And it was quite a number of airplanes, so the significance of this problem can't be understated uh, in terms of designing something that had to be retrofitted. So what should have taken nine to 12, or what we expected, I should say, to take nine to 12 months took six months. So the power of the team was that you put all the right people together in one place and they can find the problem, they can find the solution and then get it done. And it was one week between when we did the static test on the airplane to prove the design and when we first flew the airplane. So uh, the team really came through. So you do taxi tests, low speed and high speed taxi tests. Of course, the high speed taxi tests, you always worry about the chief pilot getting carried away and continuing the rotation and making it a first flight. But uh, our chief pilot, Captain Carriker, <coughs> was able to restrain himself and uh, completed the testing. And then we had first flight uh, in December 2009. And uh, using the analogy of children again, if uh, power on is when your child is born, this is kind of like the first steps. Uh, it's a very emotional thing for people who have been on the program and spent a lot of time, a lot of effort to see the airplane take first for flight, take first flight is, uh, is just a great, great experience. Uh, it was a really rainy day in Seattle. And so uh, the airplane didn't get to complete all the tests we hoped to complete on first flight. Uh, just because the pilots couldn't maintain VFR uh, in the, uh, the cloud cover that day. So they came in and landed knowing that they would have uh, lots more chances in the near future to fly the airplane. We added other airplanes to the fleet. This is uh, ZA-003 and 004. We also added ZA-002 uh, to the fleet. So we had four airplanes powered by Rolls-Royce engines in the flight test program. Airplane number one is uh, the one we use to uh, do things like do flight control checks, clear flutter, uh, low speed aerodynamics testing like takeoff testing. Uh, the airplane number two we use for the, a lot of the systems work, checking out the systems on the airplanes. Airplane number three had uh, an interior in it, so we were able to do a lot of our interiors work uh, that we need to do for certifying that. And then airplane number four is the one we use for high speed tests, uh, high speed aerodynamic checks uh, like fuel mileage uh, tests. So we had uh, four airplanes in in the fleet by uh, early 2010. In March, we did the ultimate load wing test. 
And if you look real carefully, kind of through the center of the picture there, you'll see the wings are deflected up, in case you're wondering, 27 feet. So um, the ultimate test, of course, is 150% of design limit load. Uh, because of composites and the fact you have to design for high humidity and high temperatures in terms of uh, how the materials, uh, their, their structural integrity, we knew that we wouldn't break the wing at 150%, but it did deflect a lot. So um, when you're flying on an airplane through turbulence and you see the wing flexing a little bit, uh, don't worry, it can flex a whole lot more. One of the beauties of an asset uh, or a product like an airplane is you can take it anywhere to do any kind of testing. And so using that to our advantage, uh, we took the airplane to places around the world uh, to do different types of testing. Extreme weather testing in Florida, as you see, low altitude in the Arizona desert, uh, high altitude in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Eventually, uh, airplane ZA-005 uh, became airborne. It was the first GE-powered airplane. So uh, that airplane was used, obviously, to check out uh, the GE propulsion system on the airplane and make sure that you know it uh, worked just like the Rolls-Royce engines uh, relative to the airframe. And then the pilots from ANA got to fly the airplane for the first time. So the launch customer, uh, their pilots had the honor of uh, going up in one of the test aircraft and trying it out. And all I need to do is point to the smile on the face of the pilot on the right-hand side there coming down the stairs, the uh, chief pilot for ANA. Uh, they were just absolutely delighted with the airplane, how well it worked. The guy with his hand up in the air is uh, Mike Carricker, our chief project pilot. And then we started showing it off around the world. So we took flight test airplane to uh, Farnborough Air Show and, uh, and let folks there see it, people at the air show. The second GE-powered airplane, ZA-006, uh, took off in October 2010. Uh, some of the testing done on that airplane, uh, in addition to what we did on airplane number four, was the ETOPS testing, so making sure the airplane was ready for long-range overwater flight. And we took an airplane down to one of those really difficult places to fly an airplane, La Paz, Bolivia. Uh, the field elevation is uh, over 10,000 feet. Uh, just to make sure that the airplane would operate uh, everywhere we needed it to. So by February of 2011, we had made uh, 1,000 flights and 3,000 hours. So you wonder about, you know, uh, what, what's involved in a flight test program. And this is just the flight test. It, that doesn't include the ground testing uh, in the flight test program. Uh, 1,000 flights and 3,000 hours. Uh, by February 2011, and of course more than that by the end of the program. So we had to start training pilots, and this is another aspect of a program that people don't think about. Um, not only do you have to design and build an airplane and get it tested, but you have to design and build uh, moving base flight simulators, lots of them, to train the crews that are gonna have to fly the airplane once it's delivered. And again, that's kind of a program within a program. Obviously, a lot of the hardware is the same hardware as on the airplane, but uh, working with the suppliers to build a motion-based simulator is no simple task. And especially with the challenges we had had on the program with regard to schedule, uh, this all had to move in unison and had to be coordinated. But we got it done and we started training the pilots. We do something called a service-ready validation. So in July, we put the airplane into service and uh, with ANA, and so they had some designated routes that they flew the airplane on to make sure that their pilots, their maintenance crews, their operations were ready to, uh, to operate the airplane. And uh, they did a little water salute there as the airplane taxied in. And then in July 2011, we completed the flight testing uh, for certification. A lot of work that has to be done then after that in terms of getting the reports into the FAA so that we can uh, get the actual certification on the airplane. And that was awarded then the following month in, uh, in August. One of those unusually bright sunny days in Seattle. That led us to the first delivery in September 2011. Uh, that was a rainy day. It rains a lot in Seattle. 
Um, but it didn't dampen people's spirits. Uh, a and A was just delighted to be getting the airplane. Uh, all of the employees uh, were out there on the tarmac, uh, standing in the rain, uh, just really absorbing it all and, and feeling really good about it. So a month after that, and you see this goes very fast once you uh, get the certification testing done. It's just like every month uh, you're, you're into something major in terms of the program milestones. So entry into service occurred in October 2011. And then we decided we better uh, show it off to all of the customers and all the people that had been a part of the program. So we took airplane, I think it was airplane number three, and uh, started flying it around the world in a series of tours. We, we called it the Dreamliner Tour, but it was essentially a, a series of tours where we took it to uh, all the major suppliers around the world. We took it to the customers that had bought it, let the, their employees walk through the airplane and see what it was they were getting, uh, get all excited about it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun for our team, obviously a lot of fun for the customers and the partners who had worked on it and uh, spent so much time on it. And finally, I think uh, to cap it all off, um, the NAAA, uh, the National uh, Aeronautics Association uh, awarded uh, the program the Collier Award. And a number of us from the program got to go back to Washington, D.C. And, uh, and be part of the ceremony uh, receiving this award on behalf of the team. And, and it really is a team award. It really uh, recognized the achievement of all of those thousands of people that had put a lot of hard work uh, given up a lot of their free time, their personal time, to be able to make this airplane happen. And it took a bit longer than what we had hoped. Uh, we pushed technology really hard, but in the end, uh, we prevailed, we we're successful, and I think that's what the award uh, shows. And of course, we brought the guest of honor. We had uh, the, uh, the airplane there uh, parked behind uh, the hangar where the ceremony was. So that in, uh, I think, about 43 slides is, uh, as quickly as I can tell the story of uh, what it takes to create an airplane like this. Uh, one of our, our bosses who started the program with us and retired uh, before we finished uh, had made the statement that a new airplane program is not for the faint of heart and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, it's, uh, I mean nothing could be closer to the truth. Uh, it is really, really uh, a challenge to do something like this, but it is so rewarding uh, and some of your fondest memories uh, when you look back are the people that you got to work with, again, the team that you got to work with to make this happen. So it, uh, it'll be a great airplane. I hope uh, all of you get to fly on it soon. Uh, it is being delivered to more and more uh, airlines. Uh, someone told me that we delivered uh, seven airplanes on December 20th, so uh, there's a lot of them out there uh, uh, entering into service, and uh, we're ramping up. The 787-9, uh, I believe, this delivers in 2014, if I remember right. And uh, so both, both models will be out there, and we're working on uh, looking at in product development uh, perhaps another variant of the airplane. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, we're, uh, we're short on time, and I knew we would because I, I had a lot of things I wanted to say. Uh, I'm going to be in the reception afterwards, so if anyone has any questions they want to ask uh, myself, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will be there, and we'd love to, uh, to talk about it some more. So thanks for your attendance. Thanks for your listening. There we go. Thanks, Tom. Actually, I think we will have a little bit of time. Yeah, thanks, Tom, for a very interesting lecture. I, um, uh, I look forward to flying on the plane myself, and you mentioned courage, and one of the thoughts that went through my mind or as, went, as a Boeing employee was the courage the company had and the people had, you and your, and your team, to make it the decisions that they made, switch from aluminum to composites. That's a huge, huge risk, and, and the business uh, approach that was used, they didn't come without their challenges, but they, it was a very uh, courageous thing, and I'm proud to be a, an employee of the company as well. And, and see that kind of courage and innovation and, 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 and foresight and vision go forward.
So with that, I get the uh, distinct pleasure of getting to hang a, uh, a very cool um, metal on you. This is really, really neat. If I can do it without messing up here. That's right. There we go. That. And we're going to get a picture here. You also get a, a, a pen and a, and a certificate. You know, we do, we do have a little bit of time, so um, uh, do, you, do we have any questions out in the audience for Tom? All right, there's one back there. Go ahead, I'll let you field the question. Unless it's hard. Yeah. Hi, uh, very nice presentation. Um, I'm a student that works in jet noise, so I'm going to ask a selfish question here. Um, I noticed that there's chevrons on the engine. Uh, how much quieter is the 787 than the other commercial jets that are out there? And is it possible that you can give uh, some sort of uh, level of noise reduction that was achieved uh, on this program? The acoustics up here are terrible. Yeah, I'm not sure I, uh, I heard all of that. How much more something is the 787 than traditional? Uh, how much quieter is how the... How much quieter? Yes. Very good question. Yeah, so uh, the noise uh, regulations, uh, of course, keep getting more and more stringent. And, uh, and so the 787, uh, from a community noise standpoint, is, uh, I forget how many dB it is, uh, quieter than the, uh, than the rule. Um, I retired six months ago, and you start losing some of those facts when you, uh, when you retire. Um, the, the interior noise of the airplane is very comparable to our existing airplanes like the 777. Um, and the flight deck noise, which is something that we paid particular attention to because of the design of the nose of the airplane, is extremely quiet. So for the flight crew, it, it provides a, a very good environment. But the airplane is set up to meet the noise regulations that it's it required to meet, um, you know, Certainly, it was able. We were able to certify it, but it meets uh, what we see in, in the future uh, for quite some time. So, it is very quiet in the community. We uh, we flew the airplane into Oshkosh. Um, I guess it was two years ago, and uh, when we took off and, and flew out, uh, one of the reports I read in the newspaper is they talked about or commented about how quiet the airplane was. So, you know, we do all this fancy measuring of the noise of the airplane, but the perceived noise was, was really low, and, and the person writing the article said, uh, it's much quieter than my neighbor's lawnmower. So, uh, so anyway, it is uh, very good. Uh, that's a great question because it is a very good airplane in the community because of its, uh, its noise characteristics. Thank you. You still have time for another question? Okay, so um, earlier you talked about the wing flex of the 787 and the tips. You said somewhere around 20 to 30 feet, I think, of deflection. Is it? And you said it could go much farther than that. Is it possible to maybe get them to go all the way up and touch wing tips? <laughs> uh, no, you cannot touch the wing tips. It would, it would break. Uh, yeah, so it's 27 feet. Uh, how much beyond that? Uh, it would have gone, uh, it's hard to say. It. Again, composites are affected different from uh, metal when you design it. You have to allow for humidity, you have to allow for temperature because as the temperature goes up, the humidity goes up, you lose a little bit of the structural strength of the composite. So we have to design it for the extremes of the envelope. And that's how we knew that at 150%, uh, we wouldn't break it. Um, I remember uh, when we tested the fuselage, which is also composite, um, and we pressurized uh, the, the fuselage. We took it up, um, I think it was to 200%, if I remember right. Again, you kind of start forgetting some of these facts, but uh, we, we had to stop the test on the pressurization because the, uh, 
the fixture and stuff couldn't take any pressure higher. The fuselage was doing fine. I mean, it was creaking and groaning, but uh, you know, it, it withstood the pressure uh, that it needed to withstand. So composites are a fabulous material uh, to work with. I mean, we've always known that they're lightweight and high strength, uh, particularly for an airplane. Uh, they're a good material because of their fatigue and corrosion characteristics. So one of the biggest problems you have with an aluminum airplane uh, even with the very advanced corrosion protection we put in it is in certain areas where the airplane gets wet, you start having to deal with that and the airlines have to deal with it in maintaining the airplane. Uh, also fatigue, every time you go through a pressure cycle on the fuselage or flight cycle on the wings, uh, you start fatiguing metal and composites in the, the regime that we're designing, uh, those just aren't an issue. So uh, it, it's a wonderful material to work with. We just had to figure out how to build it cheaply uh, cheap enough that the airlines could afford it. And uh, in fact, the cost of a 787 uh, is very comparable uh, to you know, the airplane it replaced. So, um, so we achieved that. But uh, touching the wingtips would be a little bit of a stretch. Any more questions? If not, we'll uh, call it a night. And once again, thank uh, Tom for a great lecture. Certificate.